today, I want to share a story with you about my sister Anais and myself. A story about a young woman who for the past six years has been dealing with two devastating chronic illnesses. And me, her brother, who's tried to be there every step of the way. When people ask me why I'm always there for my sister, I answer simply because I love her and because I want to be there for her. You see, we grew up inseparable, playing sports, video games, watching TV, and doing everything in between together. Even when I went to college, we stayed close. We would call all the time, and we'd share highlights from the previous night's basketball game. Then in November of 2015, something terrible happened. Anais was hit by a car while biking. I got a phone call a few hours later. Nothing was broken. And once the bumps and bruises heal, she will be fine. Unfortunately, that couldn't have been further from the truth. While the bumps and bruises did go away, her pain only got worse. None of her doctors had any idea what was wrong. You see, the thing about invisible illnesses is just that. They're invisible. There are no physical manifestations or external problems that a doctor can use to, to make a diagnosis. Some of her doctors went as far as to say that she was faking her illnesses for attention because that's something they believe is common amongst teenagers. But we knew that simply couldn't be the case. A year and a half later, a physical therapist referred us to a neurologist who prescribed an active MRI that activates the nerves in the affected region. And finally, we were on the right path. My sister was later diagnosed with both thoracic outlet syndrome and complex regional pain syndrome, which I'll be referring to as TOS and CRPS. These two chronic illnesses would change my sister's life forever. But at the time, we took a sigh of relief. At least there was a diagnosis. TOS is most commonly found in athletes that partake in sports that require repetitive movements like swimming or pitching in baseball, but can also happen to those who have suffered a traumatic injury. TOS is a result of compression near the first rib and leads to hyperactivation of the central nervous system. Over time, the nerves get exhausted and the entire arm and shoulder of the affected region essentially shut down. If diagnosed early enough, the effects of TOS can be mitigated, hence why time is of the essence. In addition to TOS, Anais was also diagnosed with CRPS. The most painful chronic condition according to the McGill Pain Index those who suffer from CRPS share that it's a constant burning sensation in the affected region. On top of this terrifying sensation, they also deal with something called allodynia, a hypersensitivity to touch, meaning that wearing the wrong fabric, a brush of the arm, or a harsh wind could lead to an incredibly painful flare. I didn't understand what my sister was going through and I had to wrestle with that fact for a long time. How could I understand what it's like to look perfectly fine on the outside, but to be dealing with so much pain and suffering on the inside? But I knew that these chronic illnesses were a part of her life now, and if I wanted to be a part of her life as well, I had to learn as much as I could about them. As I became more knowledgeable, it became clear to me that the road ahead for Anais was going to be excruciatingly painful. Despite it all, she persevered. 
It felt like our relationship was tense at the time. I felt guilty that I wasn't there for her as her body literally deteriorated. When I would go home, my mom would tell me that my sister was happiest when I was around. And while it was great that she felt so comfortable around me and was so happy, it ate me up every time I went back to college because I knew I wasn't there for her. One day I asked her why her TOS and CRPS were so severe when I had seen that others were able to go into remission or mitigate the pain through physical therapy. My sister sighed. She said that TOS and CRPS are progressive illnesses, and because it took so long between the accident and when she was diagnosed, the illnesses had time to spread and get worse. My heart sank. And I was angry. I couldn't believe that my sister lost the use of her right arm simply because she wasn't diagnosed soon enough. We continued to have conversations and I continued to learn more. And that guilt was slowly starting to melt away. A few weeks later, I came back to Anais and I said, I need your help. I want to raise money and awareness for TOS and CRPS so that nobody else has to deal with the pain and suffering that you've gone through. At first, she was speechless. But of course, she was in. And hence, in December of 2018, the Ride for Warriors campaign was born. The plan was for me to bike 1,700 miles from my home in Medford, Massachusetts to my sister down in Miami Beach, Florida in July of 2019. Although we didn't have a lot of time, we caught a lucky break early on. We were able to partner with a nonprofit called RSDSA that helps fund CRPS research, creates events for those dealing with CRPS, and provides funding for individuals that require emergency medical assistance. As time went on and the ride became more tangible, we became increasingly excited. Every day my sister taught me something new, so every day I had something new to post on our social media accounts. People became interested and our following grew. We even got a few sponsors to help us out. There was one problem though. I had never ridden a road bike. I didn't own one, I didn't know what they looked like, and I definitely didn't know how to change a tire. Thankfully, a few months later, a friend's dad let me borrow his bike. And so by the end of June, I had done a few 50 and 60 mile bike rides in preparation for a two week adventure that would require me to ride 110 miles a day. Yeah, close enough. In July of 2019, I rode 1,700 miles in 100 degree heat from my home in Medford, Massachusetts to my hometown of Bay Harbor Islands, Florida. We had a goal of raising $5,000 for RSDSA, but thanks to the support of our loving community, we were able to raise over 6,000. It was one of the hardest things I had ever done, but it was by far the most rewarding because of the people I met along the way and what they shared with me. RSDSA had introduced me to those with CRPS who lived along the route. RSDSA introduced me to those with CRPS, otherwise known as CRPS warriors, who not only opened their homes, but also shared their stories with me. They told me about the pain, the suffering, the anguish. They told me about the doctors who didn't believe them who said their pain was just fake. They told me about how they had to drive across state lines to get the medications they needed because their home state had restrictions on opioids and marijuana. They told me how their family had to skip out on the fun things when they went on vacation in order to accommodate the CRPS warrior in their lives. When the tears dried, the most amazing thing happened. 
Everyone shared how thankful they were. How thankful they were to those who drove them across state lines to get the medications they needed. To those who constantly checked in and to those who tried to understand and altered their behaviors in order to accommodate the CRPS warrior in their life. The last thing everyone said before I left was thank you. Thank you for doing this for us. Thank you for seeing us. The last thing they said before I left was thank you. Thank you for doing this for us. Thank you for seeing us. The reason we called it Ride for Warriors was because we wanted to honor those who were battling their illnesses every day. Illnesses that didn't just go away with rest or exercise. Illnesses that haunted people late into the night and would flare up regardless of what you were in the middle of. By the time I left the last CRPS Warriors home, I had learned something incredibly important. These warriors weren't just stripped of their health. They were stripped of their visibility. You see, as time goes on, it became harder and harder to go out, see a movie, travel, or do any of the other things that able-bodied people can do without giving it a second thought. They felt invisible. Many warriors shared how they felt self-conscious that they were being a burden to others, and so instead, they just stayed home. As time went on, they disappeared. They were out of sight, out of mind. It was then that I realized why I had felt so guilty when my sister was first diagnosed with her illnesses. And why, how, over the last few months, that guilt had all but melted away. The answer was simple. I began to feel comfortable asking questions. When my sister was first diagnosed, I was so happy for her to finally have an answer. But I was too afraid to ask her any questions about it. Because I didn't want her to feel like I wasn't listening when she explained something the first time. So instead, I simply waited for her to share more with me. I wasn't being a good brother. I wasn't being a good friend. And I wasn't being a good ally. At the onset of Ride for Warriors, my sister and I had many conversations about TOS and CRPS. As those conversations became more and more complex, I naturally had more questions. And to my surprise, my sister was more than happy to answer those questions because it showed that I cared. I became comfortable saying, I don't understand your pain and I never will. But I'll do whatever I can to be there for you and to accommodate you so that our relationship could grow. Learning to say that made all the difference. And now I'm up here on this stage to help others become better allies to those dealing with chronic illnesses in their lives. One of the best tools that I've found is called the spoon theory. It highlights the idea of having limited stores of energy represented by spoons. And if you spend too much energy one day, you'll be paying for it in the coming days. Each day a person has 12 spoons and it's up to them to decide what they will spend those 12 spoons on and just as importantly, what they will not be doing that day. This chart does a great job of creating a visual of the decisions and the dilemmas that some people with chronic illnesses have to face on a daily basis. As you can see, 
the stores of energy run out quickly. Many warriors that I talked to shared that one of the hardest things they had to deal with on a daily basis was not being able to do all the things they wanted, at least not without sacrificing showering or eating a meal. CRPS warriors aren't born with their illnesses, meaning they go from a life where they have infinite stores of energy to one with a finite amount in the blink of an eye. One CRPS warrior shared that in order to cope with her new reality as someone with CRPS, she had to first come to terms with the fact that she will never be the person she was before her illness and that it wouldn't be fair to herself to use that person as a frame of reference of what she can and cannot do. As an example, my sister went from being a varsity athlete to not being able to hold a spoon in her right hand in a matter of months. Understanding the spoon theory really helped me understand, at least in principle, what my sister was going through. I knew that if she had a test coming up, I should only send her words of affirmation and not expect an answer because it would require her to waste spoons on messaging me instead of spending her time studying. When we would go for walks, I would always walk on her right side in order to decrease the likelihood that someone would bump into her hurt arm and shoulder, inducing a flare and wasting more spoons. Most importantly, whenever we would go out, I would always offer to get ice cream. Not because we ever really needed ice cream, but because it was a built-in break, allowing her a chance to rest and recover without feeling guilty for making a stop. If there's a person in your life that has a chronic illness, I encourage you to listen to their story. My sister, the CRPS warriors I met, and everyone with a chronic illness has their own unique story. And while those stories will be unique, becoming a good ally will always start with learning and understanding from their stories. I'm sure it's really hard to talk about one's illness over and over again. But from my experiences, when you come back asking more complex questions, people are more than glad to share more with you. It's because you went home, you internalized their pain. You learned more about it on your own and you came back asking new questions, trying to better understand them. These are all examples of restoring visibility. Once you do this, you'll start noticing new things about the person with chronic illnesses in your life. For example, my sister has allodynia, the condition I spoke of earlier that has to do with hypersensitivity to touch. Well, whenever it was a windy day out, I would always try to stand in front of the wind. And although, of course, I wouldn't block all of it, I hoped that I would at least be able to block enough so that it wouldn't induce a flare. That showed that I was there for my sister and that I understand and see her. <laughs>